Good morning, everyone. My name is David Brooks, and welcome to the State of Open Source Games and Open Source Game Tools in 2021. Uh, before I get into the weeds of it, I absolutely have to thank the two talented artists, Victoria and Sven, who dedicated time and a lot of effort and love making some cute penguins to make the uh, slide deck a little bit better. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm a cybersecurity engineer by day. I'm a computer science master's student at night studying uh, game development and computer science at the University of New Orleans. I am an NDD game developer, Linux gamer, open source gamer, uh, gamer on Linux, any, any combination you can think of. Basically, I moved to Linux as my primary gaming platform back in 2012, and it wasn't quite as easy as it is now uh, to make it a game platform. On the agenda today, we're going to be looking at a uh, history of where we are with open source games uh, to understand where we are in 2021 and where we're probably going. We need to take a look back and where we've been. Uh, we're also going to look at some open source gaming tools that enable us to play Windows-based games, usually closed source games, on Linux. Those tools include Wine, Crossover, Lutris. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of the technologies that enable those games to work from uh, specifically the Kronos group. We're going to look at what OpenGL was and is, uh, where Vulkan came from, OpenXR, uh, and then Valve's contributions uh, to allowing us to play a lot of Windows games on Linux uh, and you know, generally have a good time. The, the limiting thing I had with this presentation was deciding what to keep in, what to keep out, because there are so many people, so many companies dedicating their time and effort to make Linux a first-class gaming platform. Uh, and in 50 minutes, I do not have enough time to talk about it, and that makes me sad. But we'll start out with a little bit of history. The first open source game that I can find, uh, and anybody can correct me if I'm not going back far enough, 1973, Hunt the Wumpus. Uh, most of us probably weren't born then yet. Uh, it is a text-based game. It features a character, you're hunting a monster called a wumpus through a series of caves. It was innovative because instead of like a grid-based cave system like apparently a lot of its peers were back then, uh, the rooms in this cave system were mapped to the surface of a dodecahedron. Um, it, it's, it's inspired us through culture. It's like the wumpus if you play d d it's made it as a character in d d uh, There's been songs written about it. It's kind of neat how far it's come. 1982 pinball constructor set, Apple IIe game, originally. Uh, this looks like CGA graphics, like if you remember ancient graphics, you're gonna get those, those teals and these purples. And uh, uh, it's interesting to see like this progression. If we get to 1992, Crossfire. This game started out as a uh, gauntlet clone, not the 3D gauntlets that we might recognize, but like, the original arcade gauntlet, the gauntlet that was on the NES, 2D overhead platformer game, and it eventually evolved into an MMORPG in, you know, the 90s, which kind of blows my mind. If we jump ahead to the year 2000, we can look at Tux Racer. This is our first kind of 3D game on this list. We see Tux in a 3D environment. We have a whole lot of more advanced graphics than, than we've had in the past. Uh, 2012, Unvanquished. Uh, it's a first-person shooter. If anybody was playing first-person shooters in 1999, 2000, you might remember the Quake 3 engine. This looks like a lot like the Quake 3 engine for a good reason. Uh, it's software back before Bethesda Bottom pretty much had a rule where they were going to open source every game engine that they've created within a couple of years of launching. Um, they did it with the Doom engines, they did it with the Quake 1, Quake 2, Quake 3 engines. Um, and it, it, it really, like, it shows a progression, right? It shows us going from these original games where developers had to make their own graphics engine, had to make their own sound engine, how to do everything on their own, to, you know, this game where they're getting, they're benefiting from all these open source contributions from corporate entities, which, uh, you know, we're all grateful for. In 2021, 2020, depending on where we start this decade, like where we start counting for Index Zero, Index One, there's been no culturally significant open source games release. Um, there's two ways to look at it. These 
games uh, are still to be released here in 2021, and uh, that could be all. Or uh, they're just not culturally relevant yet. Like we don't know about them yet. They're being developed. They're in initial release, but not enough people are playing them to get them on the majority of our radar. So they're not in a repository. You can't just do app get install game. You can't go in. Uh, you know, any any common places and just find these. So it's possible these games are being made, but in a couple of years we might see them. Looking at the number of open source games released per year and by decade, like we can see 1970s, we had a whole, you know, two games released. 1980s, we had a bit more. 1990s, we start seeing uh, an explosion of games. And the, the way a lot of people feel about it is id Software really kicks the open source game development process uh, from very, very low enthusiasm to a lot higher enthusiasm as they released all their technologies. Um, you notice I didn't specifically mention Quake 3 as an open source game because they open sourced the engine, they open sourced the technology, but they didn't open source the game. The levels, the characters, the music, the sound, everything else uh, is closed source. Well, all these other games we're talking about, uh, all the media is released under a Creative Commons license. But they're, what they did, you know, really helped a lot of people see the excitement, see the value. Number of open source games based on their initial launch date, initial release date, and are still in development. Um, it's kind of interesting to see, like, this one off here, 1984, still in development in 2021. That's, like, new chess. Um, you can still go download it. It's being maintained. Pretty cool stuff. Um, but out of the 101 games you know, we see on this chart, only 19 of them are, are still in development in 2021. Um, so if you want to make a game, you want to make an open source game, uh, please do. Uh, we were just at the keynote. We saw the Linux Foundation is releasing uh, new tools. Has already released new tools to make games. It's a you know new engine. Go get it. Go use it. Go contribute to it, please. We we all want to play what you have to make. So why is gaming on Linux so hard beyond open source games? Um, my better half tells me I play the get the Linux operating system working before I actually play a real video game game. Uh, if we look at this, this is I've done this so many times, like zero hours in, okay, I should be able to boot BSD soon or play whatever game I'm trying to make. Uh, six hours in, I'd be happy if I can get it back to where it was when I started. You know, 10 hours in, I can at least fix the problems of laptops developed, but the desktops are lost cause. And, you know, here's me and my friends, family out at sea being chased by sharks because I've been trying to get uh, gaming working on Linux. So let's take a look at some of the tools that we use as Linux gamers. Uh, Wine is a long, ongoing open source project. It one of the key components to making Windows games work on Linux. That's important because most games are released for Windows as their primary platform. Um, it's starting to change now. A lot of companies, a lot of especially smaller studios, are releasing games native on Linux in addition to Mac OS, in addition to Windows. But there's still, like, all the major companies are not doing that. It's, um, well, a lot of the major companies are not doing that yet. So what is Wine? Wine, Wine is not an emulator. So What's, what does that mean? Wine is basically taking a Windows binary, so a game compiled for Windows, trying to make it run on Linux. Uh, instead of trying to emulate Windows, uh, what it's doing is providing basically a compatibility layer. So it is taking the calls that the Windows game is trying to send to the Windows operating system, intercepting those, converting those to something that the Linux kernel can use and uh, run, then you know, back to the game. Um, it's very performant. It's it is very capable. Like pretty much any game you can think of has an entry on their website, has someone working on it, it has uh, ability to be played. I want to talk about crossover. Crossover is a paid implementation of Wine. They I think it's charged sixty dollars a year. You can open up two tickets with them. If you're new to trying to get gaming on Linux working, 
it can be a big technical hurdle. You might just want to get in and start playing your favorite game and not have to spend a lot of time. Uh, these guys uh, are basically, you know, making it where we have support. They're adding to and contributing to Wine, and they're also back forwarding everything they're doing. Uh, I don't work for them. I want people to get hired by them so they can do but, you know, more good work for us, but they are hiring. So if you're looking for a job, they need a general Wine developer, uh, support team members in QA, go apply. So Wine, uh, if we look at a Wine release short change log, we're going to see some fun things here, like added support for Wine 64 and Apple M1, which is kind of cool. So like Wine uh, has initial support on Apple's new silicon. Um, we have translation updates, so they try to make sure it works in every language possible. We have documentation updates, and this one various innocuous looking line, various bug fix, various bug fixes. And this, this is kind of what goes into a release. Uh, all, these, all these patches came from uh, unstable and then testing and eventually made it here. Some of these patches, I was hoping it'd be bigger, but some of these patches are game specific. Some of these patches are just general something having to do with wine. And it's interesting, you'll see game specific things, like your favorite game loads up and it's just a gray screen and you don't see the main menu. And it's just this weird bug in Wine. Someone has to go in there and address it and fix it. Uh, part of the reason that might happen uh, kind of goes back to the way actual games are made uh, for Windows and the process that happens. Um, there could be some strange bug the developer found when they were making it when they were testing it, they might get back with Microsoft saying, hey, we found this really weird interaction with the way our game runs on Windows 10. Um, they might come back and see, oh, this is a graphics driver issue, and uh, DirectX isn't creating the exact same output on, on NVIDIA graphics drivers, on AMD graphics drivers, and Intel graphics drivers, so they might work with all three of those companies to try to make some specific fix for their game into the graphics drivers. and those specific fixes probably haven't made it into wine up until now, um, and eventually they get there. Wine has something called the AppDB. If you're not sure how well your specific game's gonna work, uh, you can go into the AppDB, literally search for whatever game you want, and there's going to be an entry for it. In that entry, you're gonna see test results from other users, you're gonna see bug results, uh, bug postings from other users. You're going to see guides that say, all right, if you're having the issue where you launched Diablo 1, everything looks like a Christmas tree uh, instead of an actual game, then try changing these such and such settings. And there's, it's a very helpful community. It's a very responsive community. So when you post a bug, someone's usually going to try to recreate it within a day or two from my experience. Uh, no telling when it's going to get fixed. But you know, someone's going to look at it. Someone's going to try. Um, Lutris is a piece of software that enables us to kind of merge a lot of technologies together. And we don't have to think, what graphics drivers are we using to convert from DirectX to Vulkan? What, graph what uh, version of Wine are we running? All these different components that allow the game, Windows game to talk to the CPU and Linux, allow the Windows game to talk to the GPU and Linux, uh, allow the Windows game to talk to our uh, sound card, our audio device and Linux, are kind of managed, can be managed by Lutris instead of trying to do it the hard way. Um, and, and kind of going back to the, the joke about playing the Linux game, to make your computer work. Uh, right before I got this set up, um, my computer decided it did not want to mirror screens, so I am awkwardly looking over while trying to show this. Um, but to launch, you know, you know, you just install Lutris using your favorite repository. You can go to Lutris website, grab it. But to launch it, it's going to type Lutris. It's going to give us a nice little window, and this window is. Uh, you know, kind of removes all of our all of our you know, fiddly around on the command line, which is nice. If I can see, I think that one's this config. Yeah. All right. So we can go in here. We can see which version of Wine we're running. 
uh, and it's anything you have installed. It can also install other wine versions that for you. We can see over. Which one of those is DirectX or DXVK? Is that it? Yeah. That is what, 1.9.2, I hope? Cool, thank you. First audience question. Um, but there's, there's basically every setting in here that you can think of to make a Windows program run on Linux. And all of these settings were spread across multiple config files in the past, spread in multiple different config tools in the past, had to be sometimes installed manually from source. Uh, it was a jumbled mess. Lutris comes in and makes it a whole lot easier to, to manage our games. Uh, like for instance, if I want to play it, all I do is right click, click play. And it, it always makes my heart skip a beat because it doesn't do anything for a second. Um, but I've learned patience is a key. Like, don't try to kill the process. Don't don't try to do anything for a second. Like it's it's probably going to launch. It just takes a second for it to convert from trying to run on a Windows environment to, to Linux, but it is performant. It like the amount of strange things like you don't expect, like getting when Microsoft core fonts in here, getting like this is the, this is really just uh, an edge browser, like getting edge installed. Like there's so many components just to make this one simple looking, looking game launcher work that you just don't think about. And, and that's really where we want to be as gamers, right? We don't want to spend our time trying to make the computer play a game. We want to spend our time playing the game. Uh, and that's, that's what Lutris does for us. Um, this is Diablo 2's remake from Blizzard. It just came out last Thursday. Uh, my experience with it when I launched it, it immediately crashed the first time. I went into Lutris, I looked at the DXVK version, that's DirectX implemented in Vulkan. I'll talk about that more in a bit. And then uh, I realized it didn't have the latest version. I realized it didn't have the latest version and um, I did a sudo apt update, sudo apt upgrade. It went and grabbed the latest version of Lutris, latest version of DXVK. I was able to reboot, relaunch it, and then select 1.9.2. Relaunch the Battle.net launcher, relaunch Diablo 2, and I was in the game. I didn't have to fuss around in the command line. I didn't have to go look at forums. I didn't have to go really, um, that's the play button, right? Yeah, all right. Um, I, di I didn't have to go to a lot of technical effort or put a lot of um, analytical thought into trying to make this game work, which is a barrier for a lot of people. Like, I, I am one of the rare people that will go through all that trouble. And again, like, black screen, no loading. Like, be patient. This, this is common for, uh, like, the game runs great once you're in it, but, like, there might be uh, a second or two when it's not loading, but it actually is. It doesn't seem like it. I just want to show and prove that you know, some game does work here. Uh, saving. And you know, talking about like all I had to do was update my system, change a setting. Back two years ago, three years ago, and before, I would have had to either create the patch myself to make this work, or wait till someone else did which might be weeks where my friends are playing the brand new launch game and I can't, you know, I'm just sitting there looking sad while they have fun. Um, not where we want to be, but we, we are in a much better place. All right. So let's talk about some of the technologies that enables gaming on Linux, whether it's a native game or a Windows port. Uh, the Kronos Group is an open source consortium that manages OpenGL, Vulkan, OpenXR, and a whole bunch of other technologies, but we're, we're just going to look at Vulkan and OpenXR today. Um, Vulkan is like OpenGL. If you all remember OpenGL, OpenGL was and is a graphics API that gives programmers the ability to talk to the GPU and tell it to do something specific, draw a polygon onto the screen, 
create a camera with perspective, map a texture to this polygon. When you shoot a, a, a rocket across the screen, perhaps make a smoke trail with a particle system, and, uh, create a light behind it. Uh, all of those things are done with a graphics API. Uh, on open source systems, like natively, it's been uh, OpenGL. Vulkan is a spiritual successor to all that uh, and does pretty much the same thing. It is AAA ready uh, and you know it's amazing. OpenXR is a technology that they also help manage. Uh, it allows for virtual reality, it allows for augmented reality, and it's, it goes into making virtual reality possible on Linux. Like I play VR games with a, a Steam a headset, you know, a Valve headset uh, on my Ubuntu machine, and it, it's just seamless. Like I click the button, game launches, I'm happy. DXVK, so uh, Direct3D is Microsoft's version of what OpenGL and Vulkan do. It provides graphics programmers a, uh, a you know an API to be able to talk to the GPU and tell it to do things. Uh, games made on Windows generally as a rule run with Direct3D as their graphics API and Microsoft did that, you know, hey, you want your game to work on the Xbox One, you want it to work on Windows without having to do a whole lot of extra programming, use DirectX because it's going to be a unified experience for you. DXVK uh, is an implementation of DirectX that uses Vulkan to allow DirectX developed games to run uh, in the Linux environment. Valve has made a lot of contributions over the years to allowing games, whether they're Linux only games, whether they're games compiled for Windows, to work on Linux. I don't know if any of y'all were at LinuxCon. LinuxCon was the previous convention before it was called the Open Source Summit. But at LinuxCon 2013 in New Orleans, Gabe Newell of Valve came and gave one of the keynotes, just like we heard earlier this morning. He got up there, he talked about how Linux needs to be a first-class gaming operating system, and, and you know announced to the world that Steam was coming to Linux, that Valve was also making a Linux operating system that was made with gamers. Um, and since then, they, they, they've done a whole lot of stuff to help us uh, have a much nicer, much smoother experience on our Linux systems. The last week when I finalized these slides, uh, you know, on the 20th and 21st, you can see, according to Valve's own stats, how many gamers, you know, were present. So, uh, at the time, it was a current of 19.9 million and a peak of 24.2 million players worldwide. You can see our, our little stats here. Linux went up by 0.02% in, in adoption. Uh, so that brings us up to a whole 1.02% of gamers on Steam using Linux as their operating system. Uh, if we do some basic math and some hand waving, uh, that's roughly 163,200 people to 247,197 Linux gamers on Steam you know, spending real money, buying real games, using uh, various versions of Linux as their main gaming operating system, which is pretty amazing if you look at it. The so SteamOS, it started out as a Debian distribution, uh, versions 1.0 and 2.0. The idea that Valve had was they wanted to democratize uh, gaming. They wanted to gaming on consoles. They wanted to compete with Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo by not necessarily releasing their own console, but releasing an operating system that other OEMs could use to make their own console that would enable people to play every game on Steam at home, on their TV, in their living room, uh, seamlessly. Um, Dell, Dell had a Steam, Steam box, HP had one, like pretty much all the major you know, computer manufacturers made one because all it really was was a computer running uh, Debian with Valve's packages to make gaming a little bit better. Uh, it was fortunately not a commercial success. Um, 
they stopped being made. They didn't really get to sell a lot. So, current version is uh, an Arch distribution, which is pretty exciting. We'll see where that's going in a few minutes. Uh, so, Proton, Proton is Valve's internal tool that you can get for Steam. You can go to GitHub. You can download it, build from source, if you want. Uh, they say, you know, officially, oh, it's it's a Wine implementation. Uh, they basically took Wine, made a whole bunch of modifications, made it better. They're pushing all their their uh, modifications back to the main line, uh, Wine HQ as well. But and this is kind of small, right? If we look at this, this has more than Wine in it. We have OpenXR. We have uh, audio here. We have DXVK here. We we have basically all the tools you need, kind of like what Lutris does for generally gaming in Linux, like pulling Windows games for Linux. Proton kind of does that with a whole lot of extra support from Valve, uh, specifically for Steam. So Steam OS has made its way into something called the Steam Deck. Uh, I think they're going to be launching this at the end of December into next year. Uh, they claim it's going to be able to run every game on Steam right out the box. Uh, if anybody can pull that off, it's Valve because they have pushed the goalposts so far, like getting us so far to making almost every Windows game work on a native Linux environment. Um, well, they, they, they have a good shot. So, uh, this is, so the, this computer here is a Chromebook, it's um, the new Acer 173 Spin, it's got the new Intel Core i5 Evo, and uh, the Iris XE GPU from Intel, uh, and I, I got this one because it is, you know, probably our best bet, you know, on the market is something you can get, something you can afford to be able to play uh, games on Linux. There we go. <laughs> kill it. Uh, so this is the built-in Steam, uh, I'm sorry, the built-in Linux VM. Uh, I don't know if y'all have any experience with Chromebooks, but Google has started dipping a Linux virtual machine with Chromebooks. You go into settings, you go into developers, you see this here, Linux development environment. Click there. Before you have it, before you have it installed, this would be a butt, giant button that says install Linux. Uh, after you have it installed, it's just a, way, a place you can manage your settings, including your disk size, like how much of your, your internal SSD are you dedicating to your VM. But you essentially launch it, you get a terminal. Uh, after you install Steam, you basically download the steam.dev from Valve's website. You go here and install it. Something. Look this way. So again, this is me playing the Let's Make Linux Work game. There we go. I got the I got, had the VM in some kind of failed state, so I just killed it and reloaded it. Not too big a deal. And here it is, like here's here's Steam. Like this is not Steam Lite, not something like Steam. This is the Steam. Uh, we can go and launch a game. We'll try Half Life Two. Again, like, there's that pause when my heart drops. <laughs> Is it going to launch? Uh, but it did. Um, and, you know, here we are on a Chromebook that uh, somehow we're forcing it <laughs> to, to run, to run Half-Life 2 on here. So this, this is a 2K display. Uh, graphic settings are maxed out. Um, you can see it's loading quickly. 
you can see that the game looks like it's supposed to. We're not getting visual artifacts. We're not getting audio artifacts like the sound. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job. No one is more deserving of a rest, and all the effort in the world would have gone to waste until... Well, let's just say your hour has come again. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. So wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ashes. Yeah, and here we are, we're, we're in the game, we're playing, uh, we basically had to do very little work to get this, get to this point. Um, so, if you, if you go and look at the images that Google has for reference boards for Chromebooks, you're going to see something that popped up late last year, probably I think October, November, uh, something called Borealis as a reference board. Uh, and from what the Chromebook community has been able to suss out, it's um, Valve working with Google to make Steam be a native app on Chromebooks. And essentially it's going to be a native app on Chromebooks by running its own Arch-based virtual machine, which is going to essentially be um, uh, you know, Steam OS running as a VM in here. And it eventually will become, uh, it will just be an icon on your Chromebook. And behind the scenes, it's going to be launching this VM. It's going to be managing Proton, which is managing DXVK and Wine and Pulse Audio and all the other technologies that it needs to happen. But to the user, they're going to see a Steam icon. It's going to launch. It's just going to work. That's that's what they're trying to do. Uh, the only caveat is that right now it's only for x86 base. Uh, CPUs. So if you're on an Arch, um, not Arch, uh, if you're on anything else, it's just not going to work, sadly. Um, quick limitation. This is essentially only running, only able to run native Linux games right now. So this is Steam. This is like Half-Life 2 has a build for Linux, uh, but we can't run games that are developed in DX, uh, DirectX yet. Mainly because there is not a DirectX DXVK implementation for the GPU that the virtual machine, the Linux virtual machine on this thing has. Like if you ask this thing, well, what kind of GPU do you have? It's going to say, and my manufacturer for my GPU is Red Hat. And you're like, wait, Red Hat makes hardware? I thought it'd be Intel, I thought it'd be Nvidia, I thought it'd be AMD, one of those, not Red Hat. But it'll also say, this GPU is a Vert IO, which is a software GPU that Red Hat made that gives this virtual machine essentially hardware level access to the GPU, like on the metal, on this system. So we're not, um, we're not virtualizing a GPU and then you know, sending that to the physical GPU. We're just doing a pass through with Vert IO essentially. Um, but Vert IO does not yet have uh, a DXVK driver. So we can't run DirectX games on the Vert IO GPU that our virtual has inside our Chromebook. It, it is being made. You can go out there and build your own virtual machine like if, if you you go out there, you can grab an image of Arch, you can go grab all the patches, you can get basically what Borealis is going to be all running on your own. Um, or you can just like wait till probably February and it'll probably just work by then. I'm going to say it, 2022 will be the year of the Linux desktop. You know, here we are, you know, XKCD has a comic for everything. You know, this guy saying, 
It took a lot of work, but this latest Linux patch enables support for machines with up to 4096 CPU, up from the old limit of 1024. And this guy's asking, do you have support for smooth full screen flash video yet? We'll scratch that out and say full uh, support for Windows gaming on Linux yet. And of course, this, this kernel developer is saying no, but who uses that? And every time I've seen anybody make a prediction like this is gonna be your, like this is a killer feature that we've needed to make Linux the main OS that people use, um, no one's ever said gaming. Gaming, uh, in my mind, I was like, it's not gonna be this year because we do not yet have gaming as a first class way to, to use Linux. Um, but thanks to a lot of the efforts from Valve, the open source community, um, you know, people we didn't get a chance to talk about today, Epic and a whole lot of other companies out there, they're, they're, they're doing their hard work to make this happen. So, any questions? All right, what you got? Uh, that is a good question. I want to say KVM, but I would need to go fact check that to be sure. And the question was, what kind of hypervisor is the Chromebook using to launch uh, an EV? Because uh, the one, the one that Google and Valve are going to be using is essentially going to use the same hypervisor as the Debian-based one here does. Um, and it, it, you can go and grab the Arch image and use it. It's going to use the same hypervisor. Any other questions? Do a poll is a, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, there's a lot of games out there that won't work, not because we don't have graphics drivers or wine, but because the games are developed with an anti-cheat mechanism that is just is not supported on, on Linux yet. And uh, Epic Games uh, and Valve actually, and it, it is it's crazy awesome how fast this is moving. Like this is, I think, news that is two days old. Uh, they both announced that their mainline uh, anti-cheat software now uh, has native builds on Linux. Uh, so games like Fortnite, uh, which otherwise would run fine on Steam with Proton, uh, on Lutris, you know, with DXVK and everything else, uh, we're just missing that anti-cheat mechanism. Uh, but now that it's officially you know, come from Epic as a native build to Linux, uh, it, we should start seeing that come through as soon as specific game developers are able to implement it for their games and make it work for their games. Um, it's also possible that Valve might beat them to it and say, we really want Fortnite or whatever game to just work uh, because they have a financial incentive uh, from the Steam Deck coming out late this year or early next year. Uh, they might do the hard work themselves, but um, it's just a matter of time now, now that the technology's there. Any other questions? So I'm curious, how many of y'all are like gamers on Linux? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Awesome. Uh, y'all been, anybody want to shout out? Y'all like, been gamers for a while? Like, is this something new y'all tried? Y'all been doing it for a while? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> cool. Well, if that is all the questions we have, I guess we can go ahead and call it a wrap. Thank you, everybody.